Thank you. Today I'm going to be talking to you about a study that I was involved with uh, last year with the University of Sydney and also I'm going to talk about some of the current research around sedentary postures and hopefully give you a few tips that you might be able to take back to your workplaces and organisations to look and try and tackle this issue. So as you've already heard, I'm an occupational therapist. Um, I'm currently doing a short-term contract with Extrata. Um, I have spent quite a bit of my career up in the Northern Territory, so um, certainly done a lot with the Indigenous health sector um, and more recently back to vocational rehab in the mining industry and uh, having a strong focus on this issue of the ageing workforce. So the study that I was involved with was funded by the New South Wales Office for Ageing and the, uh, the aim was to measure workability across six organisations. And I was lucky enough to meet Dr Martin Mackey at a conference and he was looking for someone in the mining sector to participate in the study. So we were fortunate enough um, to be a part of that. So the site that I currently work at is Bulga Underground. We are a underground coal mine in the Hunter Valley, approximately 15 kilometres from Singleton. We are part of a complex, so it incorporates the underground and the open cut. We're on approximately uh, 5,500 hectares of land there. We are uh, a long wall operation, obviously. We unfortunately had a heating incident in 2011, which left us largely non-operational for 12 months. So at our site itself, it's been a little bit turbulent. Um, however, we are back and running, and we're currently having our first long wall move, which for me in managing injuries is um, quite a busy time for me, unfortunately. We also uh, have the development section with our continuous uh, miners. We are set to mine about 7 million tonnes this year. So far we've mined about 2.5 million, so we've got uh, quite a way to go. And we've uh, mined about 30 kilometres of development roadways so far. So this workability construct, the framework uh, was actually developed by the Finnish Institute of Occupational Health. Um, and this promotion of workability, it looks at uh, the workers' ongoing capacity to perform their work and includes interaction between individual resources, being health, functional capacity, skill education, values, motivation and job satisfaction, as well as working conditions. So we're looking at both the mental and physical demands of roles. Uh, we're looking at the work community and environment, as well as the age relation and uh, injury health and wellbeing. So this measurement of workability or the workability survey, it was actually designed by the Sydney, Monash and Swinburne Universities and it measures workability in two terms or two dimensions, being the, both the organisational capacity and the personal capacity. And organisational capacity includes variables such as the relationship uh, between the workers and their supervisors, experiences of workplace discrimination, levels of perceived respect and autonomy, as well as the measurement of personal capacity, which looks at physical and psychological health, work-life balance, competence, work benefits, and uh, social support. So through this workability survey, it is then possible to develop a score from one to 10 to then measure that personal and organisational capacity. So I'll take you through some of the results that we actually found. So what we did at Bulgar Underground was because we were looking at the impact of, of health programs or measuring that on our ageing workforce, we timed it with a health improvement program or a 16 week biggest improvement program that we were going to run. And we had a figurehead of, uh, of Michael Klim. And so what the program involved was doing individual health assessments and then individually tailored programs from that. People could weigh in um, and then they were communicated with regularly via email. They had an online health portal that they could go in and check their results um, and see how they were tracking. And I guess the main aim of this study was to look at whether the participation in this health program actually had an effect on workability in our ageing workforce in particular. So what happened is that the University of Sydney come out and met with all of the crews at the start of the 16 week program and they delivered the uh, workability survey and then at the, um, at the end of the 16 weeks they come back again and met with all the crews and re-surveyed to look at any results or differences that had occurred over that 16 weeks. So our participants, um, it's quite interesting talking about the lack of females in the industry. I think we have 12 
um, at our site in total. So 95% was actually males who participated, which for an underground environment um, and due to the physical demands, that's probably not something that's too uncommon. Um, the median age of our workforce was 37 years. Um, our youngest, our trainees, 18, though we have people through to the age of 64. Um, people work anywhere from zero to 70 hours. I don't know how many work zero. I wouldn't mind some of that sometime, but generally about the 40 hour mark. And we have five underground crews, uh, which work an eight week rotational roster, as well as the surface staff, as we're called, that have that uh, administration and underground role. Um, and we have obviously um, five of the groups work during the week and then we have uh, one crew who works weekend night shift. So I guess looking firstly at uh, looking at career support and to what extent people felt they uh, support they received from their employer. I mean, I think um, at the time this study was taken, may I say, this was before things uh, really, uh, we felt the headwinds as Jeff spoke about earlier. Um, so I think if we surveyed our workforce again now, you might see um, some quite differing results on, on some of this. Although at the time people felt they got reasonable career support um, and people actually felt that they, their skills, they were able to use them. That was one of the areas that we did see um, come through. And people also felt that I guess they had future promotion opportunities within the company. Um, and I guess you're looking at about 35% of those thought they were quite good opportunities. Um, if we're looking at the organisational personal capacity, um, once again, discrimination was very low at our workplace, which was um, very encouraging to see. Um, things like work control, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit further, but people that uh, generally with the trending looked at work control, the very poor results or, or people who felt they had uh, poor work control were more of the, the surface group or the administration group. Um, skill usage was high, which was good to see. Um, people perceived their general health as being um, quite high, which um, always intrigues me because the actual results of the 16 week program, I think we had something like 78% had um, you know, very unhealthy looking BMIs. So sometimes I guess people's perceptions and, and what we saw was a little bit different. Um, number of diseases and injuries was low. And once again, with psychological wellbeing, which Jennifer will talk about next in the, the mining industry, um, once again, from that surface, st surface staff, they actually reported the higher levels of unhealthy psychological well-being. So this study really alerted some areas um, with mental well-being with the surface operation staff that needs to be addressed. Uh, Work-life balance, again, it was more of the surface staff. Um, all the, generally, all the contracts read that you perform the hours necessary to get the job done. So unlike the underground crews, they don't have those set hours. So they're tending to do the much, the much longer hours. So that was something that they thought was an issue. Um, intrinsic rewards, once again, um, didn't score too badly, and extrinsic rewards. Um, if you looked at that overall scores for organisational and personal capacity, they weren't too, too dissimilar, I guess. Um, and the average scores for, once again, self-rated workability. So job security, like I said, we scored quite well on this. However, I think if you probably did this at the moment, um, you'd see that being much lower. I know with um, our current EAP usage, one of the trends that we're starting to see is people having concerns over job security um, and you know that retention um, issues. Training, um, once again, there was one particular crew that didn't feel they got enough training. Um, all the underground crews get the same amount of training, so that was a little bit interesting as to why uh, one particular crew thought that. One of the things that we have implemented since this study is that the surface staff now get to access training relevant to them. It was something that was um, perhaps overlooked um, in the past. Once again, um, stress, um, the higher levels of stress were from the surface staff. Um, I am seeing though this year uh, with EAP, our usage has significantly increased. So um, I think that's something that's on the rise across the industry. Exhaustion levels, once again, um, a bit of an issue for the surface staff and self-rated workability was very high. Um, when we looked at physical activity though, um, not too many of our staff um, exercise on most days, generally um, you know, once a week for every few weeks. Um, one thing that I did see though was 
when we ran that 16 week biggest improver, that was our highest gym usage for the year. So Extrata offers free gym membership to all employees and the most, the highest levels of participation were over that 16 week program, which given it was winter in the Hunter Valley, I thought that was a fairly promising and a good commitment from the workforce to see. Of course though, that doesn't measure other activities that our workforce may be involved with. That was one of the only ways that I could look at what they were doing in terms of um, physical activity. However, I guess looking at the, the job demands of the underground miners, um, it is quite physical work. So I think for a lot of them, they perceive that they do that physical activity at work um, and don't perhaps do too much outside of it. Um, and if you look at the, the higher levels of moderate activity, you know, they are associated with less disease, lower levels of exhaustion, um, better psychological health, which is certainly something we'd like to improve on, um, self-rated workability, and that organisational and personal capacity. So in summary, um, we, were, we scored highest or strongest in our um, perceived respect from management, which um, was good to see, although I guess um, slightly disappointing for me was during the 16-week program that we ran that biggest improver, um, none of the senior leadership actually participated in that. And um, so I think it's good that obviously the staff still still um, their respect for management change but it would have been nice to see I guess the management being involved in some of the projects as well we might have had um, better uptake. Once again skill use was high, discrimination was low and um, psychological health. Areas for improvement, um, like I said a lot of this with the control over work come from our surface staff, um, intrinsic rewards and I can I think for the surface staff certainly it can be um, isolating at times and there are areas in that in that area in the training, which as I said, particularly with the surface staff is something that we've since rectified. Um, this one just goes through the crews and like I said, the surface staff are the, uh, the technical, the admin staff. Um, and black crew is actually our crew that does the weekend night shift. So they spend, I guess, the least amount of time um, at the workplace, but yet they have one of the high levels of stress. And um, on that particular crew, there's quite a number of our older workers. So um, I thought there was a few things in there that was interesting to look at, um, as well as, um, you know, with the surface staff, with the work-life balance. And once again, with job security, that weekend night shift had quite low job security being that older workforce compared to the rest of the workforce. Uh, I kind of talked about this already, I guess. It's just looking at how the crew's um, rated. Once again, the black crew, with, which has a lot of our old, older workforce, spends a uh, minimal, minimal amount of time at the workplace. They um, obviously didn't feel they got enough training. So I guess it alerts, you know, to a few sorts of issues that perhaps, you know, with your older workforce, as we know, maybe they do need some more training, particularly um, with the modern technologies. And, and I guess something that come out of the 16-week program was that the provider uh, that we got in to run it had this online health portal, which was excellent. You know, people could go in, track how they were going. They did regular emails. They did YouTube videos. But in actual fact, it didn't it didn't reach our older workforce at all. They, um, a lot of them didn't have a computer or didn't know how to use a computer. Um, the emails just weren't a great way to communicate with them. And for one crew, I actually trial printing out all these emails and so on their crib breaks, they could sit and read them. And the winner, or the overall winner, um, actually come from that crew. So whilst I don't know whether it was the printing out of the emails, I thought it was an interesting correlation that um, perhaps some of those technologies aren't the most successful way to communicate with our ageing workforce. Um, how we compared to, um, I guess, national and mining industry levels um, in a few areas, I guess, um, a little bit disappointing on the discrimination. We were slightly higher. Um, areas of respect uh, from management, we were slightly lower than the national averages. Um, fortunately, though, nothing too significant there. Once again, the work-life balance and general health, we were a little bit lower. So there were a few areas um, that we need to be working on. And people who participated in that 16-week program, or True Champ, um, I guess the, the main differences we've seen in the survey results was their improved rating of their general health and improved perceptions of managerial respect from staff. But really what we worked out is 16 weeks isn't long enough. It's, it's something that you need to be doing ongoing. Um, it's not something you can just come in and do sporadically because whilst we had those really great individual successes, it's now really, you know, with the cost containment, the wheels have fallen off a bit and we're, you know, not in a space that we'd like to be. 
And the program was, was only ever going to influence that personal capacity. It didn't actually address some of the organisational capacity issues that we need to go on and now look at. So, like I said, it, it basically, the, the study showed us that we need more of a, a, co a comprehensive, something longer than 16 weeks. Um, it needs to be multidimensional, looking at both the physical and the mental health side of things as well, because I think mental health is perhaps an area that has been overlooked and, and not so much focus put on when really it's something we need to do. Um, our older workers reported the poorer workability than our younger workers, particularly in that work-life balance. Um, and like I said, some of them spend less time at the workplace. So, uh, you know, there's obviously other things going on there um, as well as intrinsic and career support. And the surface staff reported uh, highest control, but then they're more stressed and they're poorer work-life balance than their underground workers that have the set shifts. So looking at this area of promoting, promoting healthy working life in, uh, in an ageing and incre increasingly sedentary society, if we look at the actual meaning of inactivity, um, it's a range of human action that result in low energy expenditure. So basically it's that sitting or lying down. And if we start to think about, well, how much do we actually sit? I mean, driving to and from work, sitting on the couch watching TV, time spent on our computer, time spent at conferences, um, it all starts to add up. And unfortunately, as a society, we are uh, moving, moving less and, and sitting a lot more. And um, like I said, that's in, in all of our environments, whether it's work, transport, home life, across the board. And it's something that we're actually starting to do from a very young age. So if you look at the uh, transport to and from school, as you can see, from 1971, where a lot more people actually used to walk to work, or walk to school, sorry, that's now significantly declining and use of the car um, more so than the bus is on the increase. And I guess there could be a number of things that, that's, that are, play into that, perhaps security and all sorts of other reasons why people no longer do that or with longer working hours, they're not able to walk with their children to school. But I think it's interesting that it's something that we're starting to see from a very young age. And once again, from the 1960s to 2010, where people were engaged in uh, occupations that had uh, a lot higher, higher use of expenditure, we're now moving into the decline of those sorts of jobs and moving into more sedentary and, and light types of work. So what is the relevance to obesity in all of this? Well, I guess there's sort of an in energy imbalance that's created. Um, the input that we're putting in if we're looking at food intake and what we're actually putting out um, and expending is uh, becoming less, unfortunately. So there's definitely strong correlations there. And if we look at uh, psychological changes, I mean, obviously once you start to get 50, you have this much more marked decline um, with muscle strength and joint flexibility. Um, aerobic fitness starts to decline from unfortunately the age of 25, uh, 20 to 25 onwards and particularly at 30. So um, there's those psychological changes which none of us can avoid which are happening anyway in the background. So if you look at our population, I thought this was quite interesting to look at 82% um, are actually in the 45 to the 54 age group. So we actually we have a lot of, of age workforce as we know. But if you look at the statistics um, from 1990 down to 2010, what we're starting to see is that people 55 years and under are actually exiting the workforce and yet we have a much higher proportion of people 55 years and over still in the workforce. So when we're looking at that succession planning, um, et cetera, how are we going to manage that? And I think we've talked a lot about skill shortages today and, and labour shortages, which people are, are aware of, which, something, which is uh, compounding into the future. If we're looking at work injury rates, 26% um, of all work-related injuries incurred by workers in the 45 to 50-year-old age group. Um, so, and then unfortunately for some of those people, um, you know, the rate of recovery is a lot longer as well. So the sorts of issues when we're looking at an ageing workforce that we need to be tackling. Um, a little bit of information about costs. Um, as I said, I won't go too much into that because I know we're really short on time. Um, looking at work-related injuries, like I said, the, your older workforce doesn't have significantly more injuries. However, their healing rates, as we know, are slower. So that's an implication that we have to look at. Musculoskeletal changes, as I sort of mentioned, over that age of 30, it really starts to accelerate those changes that we see. Um, and um, 
compensatory capacities need to be looked at. So of course, as we know, our ageing worker looks at uh, their experience that they have um, and their knowledge that they're able to compensate um, for perhaps their physical decline and, and minimise that productivity loss. Um, so how much physical activity is recommended because as we sort of know a lot of people aren't doing it um, and one of you know the study that we did certainly showed that perhaps um, outside of work people could be doing more of that so as we know we should be doing at least 30 minutes of moderate vigorous um, intensity on most days of the week um, or 150 minutes per week and double that for children that uh, that want to lose weight um, but as we know most people don't actually achieve these targets you know, I, th I think I kind of touched on this already that we are definitely going back <laughs> to perhaps our grassroots somewhat and, uh, and that sedentary behaviour as, as sitting on the computer and more and more of that uh, screen work is occurring. The other thing too with uh, mechanisation, I think, as well as um, you know the use of lifts and elevators, I mean, how many people this morning actually opted to come up via the stairs as opposed to jumping in the lift? And I think there's some um, there's some really good chip clips on on YouTube that show you know them painting stairs and adding sound to it. And I think sometimes it's about trying to make everyday activities a little bit more fun to try and re engage people so they're not uh, taking the easier option all the time. Once again, when people go home from work, there's that preference for screen time. So I mean, how many people go home, jump on the computer, do the emailing, LinkedIn, Facebook, if you like me. Um, TV, etc., and um, as well as that low walkability. So sometimes accessing facilities aren't as easy as perhaps it, uh, it once was or as safe. Um, there's a whole range of, of reasons. And, and sometimes it's the social isolation as well. So I know with our 16 week program we ran, we really tried to encourage the guys to have a bit of a buddy system and, and keep people in check and have someone to exercise with and motivate each other. So it can work, but not always possible for people as well. Um, just some studies, I guess, showing the amount of sedentary activity, 57% um, in a study that was done, um, quite staggering. And if we look at Homer Simpson, I mean, he has quite a, a sedentary life. I think people know about, you know, he sits, he, he goes to work and he sits and he comes home and goes to the pub. And, and so, you know, a lot of people, I guess, unfortunately, tend to adopt these Homer Simpson type um, personality traits and can start to sit for longer and have detrimental effects. Medibank actually did a study as well looking at um, their employees. It was um, people could volunteer to do it. So I guess um, the types of people that may have participated were slightly um, more interested in this or, or more active anyway. But what it showed is that people who worked in their retail, their office and their call centre actually had um, very sedentary activities um, in their waking hours. And if you go to the next slide, there wasn't significant differences. Obviously, people who worked in the call centre did sit for slightly longer um, periods on work days, but overall, it wasn't that significant. And, and what they found, I guess, was, um, was that outside of work as well, um, the office staff were, were engaging in more of the gym type or the, the um, moderate activities outside of work more so than people in the retail and the call centre environments. Um, I guess it's fairly straightforward looking at mortality and obviously um, sitting times does have a really big significance on this and can be a contributing factor, particularly where people already have, you know, if they're overweight, obese, gaining, um, you know, adverse metabolic profile, insulin resistance, t diabetes type 2. So they're all compounding factors that start to play into each other. So in summary, um, too much sitting does have negative impacts on our health, um, regardless or not of whether we meet those physical activity guidelines, it still is going to have a detrimental effect on us. Um, and it may be as important to reduce that sitting time as it is to increase that physical activity um, outside of work. Um, Obviously organisational policy, we've talked a lot about personal capacity and I think it's really easy for organisations to say, you know, oh, our employees need to go to the gym more or we provide these health programs, but I think employers need to be proactive in this arena too and there's a lot of research around about using hot desks, sit stand workstations, um, moving, uh, you know, photocopiers and things like that to a more centralised area so people do have to get up and move and, and employers can be writing that into their policies and being proactive in that area. So um, 
In close, I guess some of the things that you could be doing in your workplaces, look at the sit-stand desk um, and it can be as simple as putting a box, as long as it's stable, on the desk and putting the screen on there. Um, it doesn't have to be really expensive things that you need to put in place. Um, having meeting rooms with high tables, once again ergonomically a really great idea. Um, removal of your, your rubbish bins, your photocopiers, moving them further away. Having mobile sets um, for phones and having sitting interruptions, having your outlook set up so people are getting up and moving um, rather than just sitting all day. Um, and as well, you know, going for walking meetings, another really great idea, instead of you, get, you have a sitting meeting, go for a walk and have your meeting instead, or a bit like the Queen where she stands up and gives out, you know, all her um, servants stand up while she gives her orders. So something maybe we could be incorporating as well. There is plenty of research out there. I've kind of rushed through a bit today. Um, but like I said, don't just sit there, stand up. Thank you.